the University of Texas at Austin, the Liberal Arts Development Studios present Essentials of AI for Life and Society. And now, here are your professors, Joy D. Biswas, Don Fazell, and Peter Stone. Hi, welcome to class today. So I'm Peter Stone. As you know, I gave the, the first lecture of the class, and then another of the instructors, Joy D. Biswas, gave the, the second lecture. Today, we have the pleasure of, of a, a lecture by the third instructor of um, the other instructor of the class, Professor Don Fissell. Um, Don has been a professor in the Department of Computer Science since 1980. Um, his research expertise is uh, mainly in computer graphics. Um, He's, but he's uh, served as chair of the Department of Computer Science for the past several years, um, during which time there's been a, a big uh, you know, growth and influx of, of um, artificial intelligence in computer science, and he's been there for the whole, uh, for the whole ride. Um, today marks sort of an uh, inflection point for the course. So for the past eight weeks, we've been telling you the various um, paradigms of artificial intelligence from within computer science and some of the applications vision, robotics, natural language processing. Today we're gonna to take a step back and uh, talk a little bit about the philosophical foundations of artificial intelligence and the relation to computer science in general, which is where the field of artificial intelligence grew out of. Um, and then that'll transition us for the rest of the course to more uh, broader societal implications. So with that, let me turn it over to Don. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, what I'd like to do today is provide some context, as Peter said, in terms of computer science overall for the sort of the history and growth of AI. And I guess, I, unlike other people here, I'm not an AI expert. My expertise is I've been around through this longer than anybody else around here, so I've seen more of it. At any rate, let me start with the slides that we've been looking at for the entire course up till now, which is defining artificial intelligence. And we've talked about it being Technologies are inspired by, but operate, may operate differently from the ways people do things that are you know, difficult for computers and uh, easy for people. Um, and it's uh, many things, certainly. Um, so one way to look at it is getting computers to do the things they can't do yet. I don't know if that's a useful distinction between AI and, and other art parts of computer science, because lots of people in computer science try to get computers to do things they couldn't do yet. But I'll tell you another way that you might think about this. So let me start with the origins of computer science and AI, because they were pretty tightly coupled. Uh, I have to have this slide as lip service to the fact that, yes, I mean, things, the roots of all this go back to thousands, eight, uh, thousands BC. I, I don't really have much interesting to say about what happened a long time ago, but I want people to know that we do know there's history here. What's most interesting is what's happened since 1837, which was the year Charles Babbage designed the analytical engine. He didn't build it, but he designed it, and it was very clear that A, it was programmable, and it became clear later when the idea was there of something equivalent to other computers, that it was the first design of a computer that was as powerful in principle as the computers we build today. And so that was quite a noteworthy achievement, and it led to the first computer algorithms produced by Ada Lovelace and to a certain extent by Babbage himself. So, so that was there, and then there's a bunch of things if you look at the history of computing that had to do with the technology being developed to make it possible uh, to build practical, not, mecha not mechanical like Babbage's, but practical electronic computers. And what's most interesting is to go to the 1930s. And so we're really gonna start looking seriously at the 1930s, not because they were building these machines then, but because they were a decade or so away from building machines like that and they could see it coming, so they started thinking about the question, what could a computing machine do? Uh, and so several people at the same time started looking at that question, Turing perhaps the most famous to us computer scientists, but I've listed a, a number of other people that were working on exactly these same problems, and interestingly, they all came up with different models of what a computing engine could be. And these are abstract models, they weren't building them, except that Turing's was obviously possible to be built. So in some sense, it sort of anchored the rest of it. Um, and what was interesting about these, they came up separately, and that let people define formally what is a computer algorithm, a sequence of steps one of these models could execute 
on an input to get an output. That's a very precise definition, not that we didn't have algorithms before, but that's, let's call that a computer algorithm. And it also let us ask ourselves questions like, what problems can we solve and are there problems we can't solve with a computer we could build? Now, finally, the fact that so many people came up with different models and it turns out very quickly they could prove that they were equally powerful led to something called the Church-Turing thesis, that's, that's what we call it now, which is that any effectively computable function, anything you really can compute in practice, can be computed by a Turing machine because it's as powerful as anything else we could build. Now that's not something that we've proven, at least in the sense that it's stated here, because the definition of effectively computable is a little fuzzy, so it's hard to prove, but it leads people to think that, you know, we really, a Turing machine's as good as anything else for thinking about how computers work. And it also leads us to wonder if humans are one of those equivalent uh, devices. And so, just to convince you that Turing machines are buildable, here's a picture of one. This thing basically has an infinitely long tape, and it, each cell in the tape can have a symbol on it. You can read the symbol and or write it uh, from the machine. So it's got a read-write head and it moves back and forth a step at a time along the tape, and it's got an internal state, which is basically its program, that does something with the input and produces an output. And so the thing that's interesting about this is it's obviously something you could build. Now, it's not gonna be very fast. It should be obvious as well, so we probably don't wanna use it in practice, but, you know, here's an example of one built out of Legos that actually works, except for the infinite tape. That's not in there. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a machine that we can really realize. And so, and again, it was a huge advance because we started to be able to get a handle on concrete things like what can computers do and not do. Now, Turing is generally thought of or often called the father of computer science and the father of artificial intelligence. And he wrote a paper in 1950 that sort of had a lot to do with the second part of that, one that I assigned you guys to read so you could see what he was thinking about because it was a nice paper that's very accessible uh, to people from a lot of backgrounds. And he was taking, it was his take on the question, can machines think, which is not a question he wanted to address in that form. What he wanted to do was come up with a, an empirical procedure for deciding whether machines were doing what humans could do in some hard way. And so he defined what he called the imitation game and what we now call the Turing test. So you've got an interrogator that's communicating via a text interface with two entities. In case one, one of them's a man and one of them's a woman. In case two, the man's been replaced by a machine. And the woman's trying to help him. You know, he's asking a bunch of questions and they're having a dialogue and the woman's trying to help him figure out which of them's the man and which of them's the woman. <laughs> and you know, he'll make a guess at some point and maybe he'll get it right. So then you replace the man with the machine and he'll, the same thing will happen. And the question is, was it easier to tell them apart when there's a machine there than when there's a man there? And if the answer is no, then we say the machine has passed the Turing test, okay? Now, why is this interesting? Well, I said one reason, because it was an empirical procedure for deciding whether computers were doing the kinds of things, you, you know, again, maybe he would call it thinking and maybe not, the kinds of things you were after. And two, doesn't chat GPT pass the Turing test? Haven't we done that? Does that mean that, that computers are thinking? I mean, it's a really interesting question right now because of the, the state of the, of the art. So. Now, artificial intelligence nominally started in 1956. Uh, that was the year of the Dartmouth Summer Workshop in Artificial Intelligence that was put on by McCarthy, Minsky, Rochester, and Shannon. McCarthy and Minsky being, you know, noteworthy as the founders of the field for this reason. <laughs> and McCarthy was the person who coined the term artificial intelligence, which first appeared in print in the proposal for having this workshop. And so that's generally considered the date when this, or the time when this happened. And, and again, that was something I've asked you to read because it's, it's very interesting to read what they thought they were doing back at the birth of artificial intelligence, right? And they said they were gonna focus on natural language processing and neural networks and theory of computation and abstraction and randomness and creativity 
which, except maybe for theory of computation, have all been themes throughout the history of AI. Uh, that kind of focus on hard problems that people can do, I mean, you've been learning about how that's been approached, okay? So right at the beginning, that was what they were after, and of course, the question they were really addressing in some sense was can machines think? Not exactly the same question as what, what, what can computers do, what can they, what can they think? And, and can they think as gotten through, can they do hard things that people do? And they addressed a bunch of those areas, okay? So really to me, the, the slight difference in those questions that people are trying to answer is, sort of captures the difference between people in computing that work on AI and people that work on other things. And so, uh, so let me tell you a little bit, you, you know, everybody's been telling you about what AI is up till now. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the other stuff, and that's a lot of stuff, and I'm not gonna do it justice in, in you know, what do I have, 20 minutes? Um, so the first thing we were asking is, you know, are there things computers cannot do? And the answer that Turing gave when he defined Turing machines is, yep, there are things that computers just can't do. When we call those problems undecidable or, uh, you could call them uncomputable, it's the same thing. The reason that decidable is used is because these are a class of problems called decision problems. We're just having to decide yes or no. Not all problems are like that, of course. The classic problem, not the one Turing proved in his paper, uh, is the halting problem, which you may or may not have heard of. And so the problem is this. Suppose that you, you would like to have a program, I'm gonna call it halt, <laughs> that can read the text of any other program and read the input that that program is going to read in. Look at those things and say, yes, this program will halt on this input, or no, it won't halt. That's what we want. And you can imagine that's a practical thing to do because we have lots of buggy code that we write and sometimes it gets in infinite loops and wouldn't it be nice to have a program you could feed this buggy code into and it'll say, you know what, it's going into an infinite loop on this input. So. Not, a, not an impractical thing, but you can prove that such a program cannot exist, okay? And I'm going to attempt graphically to show you how that argument goes. <laughs> so let's suppose we have this magic program in the box at the top, takes a program in, P in, input I in, and says yes or no, it'll halt with an answer or not, okay? So you start with that program and you create the second program, which I called gotcha for reasons that should be obvious. And what you're gonna do is feed P into halt as both the program and its own input. And then you're gonna switch the outputs that come out of halt. So if halt says yes, you're not gonna terminate. <laughs> you're just gonna loop forever. And if halt says no, you're gonna output a yes. Kind of a tricky thing to do. And so then you basically just run gotcha on itself. You put it in as the input to itself. And I'm gonna let you think about this for a minute. Uh, well, probably not now, you should probably think about it later. But you can easily see if you go through this carefully that you can conclude that if gotcha halts, then it doesn't halt, and if it doesn't halt, then it halts. Now when you conclude nonsense like that, that means this couldn't happen. So, um, all right, so as I've said, that's not a toy problem. There are actually a lot of practical programs that do things similar to this. But what we know from this is they are not solving this problem for all possible cases. They're solving it for things that are perhaps subsets of that or they're solving it approximately. So just because a problem is undecidable doesn't mean some variation of that can't be done. Okay, that's not the only undecidable problem. There's another famous one that was actually what Turing was talking about that, was, that said basically if you write down what you think is a mathematical theorem, which means if you can prove that it's true, it's a theorem, can you write a program that can tell for any possible thing like that whether it's provable or not? That was a very famous question at the time and the answer is no, for similar reasons, okay? And yet, one of the first successes of AI was Newell and Simon's logic theorist pr program that proved theorems from Russell and Whitehead's famous Principia Mathematica 
Well, that's fine. I mean, it could do that. That's not all theorems. That's just some subset of theorems. And so, so there's no contradiction there. And we still build automated theorem provers today. In fact, our department's kind of known for that historically. And they get used for verifying hardware and a lot of other practical things. So, you know, knowing what you can and can't do is good to keep you from trying to do impossible things. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do a variant of the problem that's important, OK? Now let's go on to the next question here, which is, okay, now we have programs we can write. We have problems that we can solve. Um, how hard are they? Are, are they all equally hard? Are some harder than others? How would we characterize that? And so, I mean, sometimes you could write a program that could solve uh, a problem, but it would take millions of years to terminate. That's not very useful. You'd kind of like to know that before you run it. Uh, a good example is chess. Another good example is Go. Those are finite problems. They, they don't have infinite games. So in principle, you could just run through all the games you could have at any given move and see what's the best move and make it, and you'd have an optimal strategy. Uh, the problem is that it's come something like 10 to the 300th states for Go, for example. So no, that's not practical. So even, even if it's you really do need to know if it's going to be too hard to do uh, to solve it exactly, and then you're going to have to do something else, okay? So how do people try to characterize hardness of problems? Um, well, first they pick a model of a computer, say a Turing machine, okay? Then they pick a resource they want to measure, say time, maybe space, if you want to see if it's going to run out of space. Then you pick a problem type. Decision problems are popular because they're, they're simple and we can see what's going on with them. So they, 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 they answer yes or no. And then what we do is we consider the size of the input. So if you're, as an example of not a decision problem sorting, where you want to sort n numbers, well, n is the size of the input. How many numbers is it, right? And so we're going to have n be the size of the input. And what we would like to do is figure out, let's say it's time that we're interested, how much time is it going to take in the worst case for any program you could, or for a program that you're running for this to solve that problem. So the, for different inputs, it's different amounts of time. You want the worst case time. And you'd like to characterize that as a function of the input size. OK, so here's, here's an example. You got a real simple program that inputs a string of characters and, sa and says yes if there are 10 A's in the string and no otherwise, OK? That's pretty easy to do. You just put up, st start up a counter at 0 and increment it every time a, you see an A on the input, right? The best case is the first 10 symbols are A's. And so you can stop after 10 because you've got it. You've got the answer. You don't even have to read all N inputs. OK? But that's not interesting to us for this purpose. What we want is the worst case, which is all the symbols come at the end, which means you have to read all n inputs before you can give an answer. And so we say that it takes order n time to do that, which means some constant times n. You know, anything where you have to read all the inputs is going to be at least that, that hard. OK? So here's another example. This is a very famous one. Uh, it's called Boolean satisfiability. So if you know anything about logic, fine. This will be easy to see. And if you don't, well, just bear with me. So you can write logic equations like this. They have three operations in there. The little upside down or sideways L is a not. The, uh, the V is an or, and the upside down V is an and. And, and you know, or and and are kind of like plus and times. Um, and, and the variables can take on values of true or false, 0 or 1, or 1 or 0, we would say. And so the question is, is there a way of assigning 1s and zeros to the input variables such that when you evaluate this equation, it's going to come back true? That's a pretty simple question, right? And in this case, if you want to check to see if you know how this works, here is an assignment of values to, uh, to these variables that will give you a value of 1 if you evaluate the expression with that. Now, one way you could do that, it's certainly decidable. You could just plug in all possible combinations of zeros and 1s. And here, this tree diagram shows all those combinations in an organized way. First, we take the first variable and look at both. And then we do the rest one after the other. And you can see that there are 16 or 2 to the n, 2 to the fourth different answers you get at the bottom. And the red ones are zeros, and the green ones are ones. So if there's any green ones, the answer is it's 
this, you know, it's, it's satisfiable, okay? That seems pretty simple, but, you know, sadly, we can't, we don't have an algorithm that we could run on the equivalent of a Turing machine that in the worst case for all possible such inputs will do it that quickly. And in fact, you know, we do know how to do it quickly if we change the computer model. So here's what's called a non-deterministic computer. Just take each one of these steps, say that top node there, and when it makes a decision to put in a one or a zero, split it into two copies of itself and let them run in parallel, and then each one of those is gonna make a decision, so it's gonna split itself into two copies of itself and they're gonna run in parallel. So you can have all these machines being created and in four steps you'll get the answer instead of two to the n steps, right? It'll be n steps. And so, so we know how to solve it efficiently with that kind of a machine. What we don't know is how to build something like that because it's making all these copies of itself, right? So we call those non-deterministic machines and now we can, so we can have different machine models with different amounts of power, and we can group problems into classes that are solvable efficiently on that machine model. So for this example, Turing machines can solve some problems we know efficiently. That's what I mean by, you know, not, not taking too large a, an amount of time as a function of the input. And we call the class of all such problems P, for non-deterministic machines like I just showed you, there's another class of problems that they can solve efficiently. We call that class NP. And the question is, are they different or the same? Is it the same set of problems or not? Well, that, you know, that's, the, that's often said is P equal NP, and that's kind of the most famous open problem in computer science. We don't know how to prove that right now. We strongly believe that non-deterministic machines are more powerful than deterministic ones and that those classes are not the same as a result, but we don't know how to prove it. Okay, so let me not elaborate on that too much. So, I just want to say one more thing. Quantum computers come up as another model of computing because that's something that increasingly looks like we might be able to build. So the question some people like to ask is how powerful is that? Is it more powerful than a Turing machine? Is it as powerful as a non-deterministic machine? And um, we don't have a lot of proofs about that either. We have evidence though. We have at least, the most famous bit of evidence is this problem called integer factorization, which is the core of cryptography, a lot of cryptography algorithms. That is to take a very large number and figure out what its prime factors are, or, or at least its integer factors are, and to do that efficiently. And there is an algorithm on a quantum computer that can do that, and we've never discovered an algorithm on a regular computer that can do that. So that suggests that quantum computers are more powerful, and it suggests a picture like this, where P is all the problems that regular old computers can solve efficiently, and NP is the class of all problems that those non-deterministic machines we can't build can solve efficiently, and the ones that are at least as hard as any of the other ones in there are the ones on the side called NP-complete, and we think that quantum stuff fits in that green circle, so it really isn't so, as powerful as, as non-deterministic non computers but we suspect it's more powerful than, than uh, deterministic computers. So it'd be interesting to know that since that's something we think we can build. Okay, so I think I've multiple times during this, I mean, there's a lot known about the intrinsic hardness of problems and what computers can do. And I, what I've been telling you is what the theoreticians have been working on, among other things, for quite some time. You know, this is kind of the theoretical approach to computer science. And I've also said that just because you get negative results doesn't mean you don't work on that problem anyway. What you do is you use heuristic, heuristics. If you know you can't solve a problem algorithmically then, or you know it's too expensive to solve algorithmically, then maybe you make an approximation to it or solve a subset of it uh, or something like that that is efficient, that can be done efficiently and you use that in practice. I mean, arguably, people do this all the time. You know, we make lots of mistakes, but we still solve hard problems, just not always correctly. Uh, and so, 
you know, you've seen heuristics referred to in previous lectures here, so I'm, I, this is just a little bit of a context for what that means. It means rules of thumb that work well. I mean, even in cases where we can prove that things are, are, are too difficult, that's often only for the worst case, but all the practical cases aren't the worst case, so you just run them anyway. And they work most of the time, but sometimes when they don't, you've got to be aware of the fact that they can't. <laughs> so, um, okay. So there's some context about at least two pieces of computing. The theory people, well, I, I'm not going to tell you about AI except make some remarks about the history because everybody else is telling you about AI. Let me just say that if it started in 1956, we had people like some of the people I mentioned before, the people who are attendees at that conference, who were saying that artificial general intelligence will be a solved problem in 10 or 20 years. They were very confident of themselves because they made early progress. And they didn't know how hard these problems were because none of that investigation had been done. Now, that was both good and bad. I mean, it's good to have that kind of confidence to keep working on things that hard, right? Because you're going to get some failures as they did later. But the bad part is it can lead to overhyping things. And what's happened in the history of AI, have there have been boom and bust cycles, you know? Yeah, we're going to solve all these problems. Yeah, we're going to have intelligent machines in 10 years. Let's put a lot of money into it. Oh, wait, we didn't get it. Let's not fund it at all. And so, you know, it's a mixed blessing. I mean, at this point, I, I'd say it's a blessing because they have been working on it for that long, and things have changed, OK? So let me talk a little bit about other revolutions we've had besides the one we're going through now. Computing's been through various revolutions that you can say. I just listed a bunch of major things that have changed the world, none of which is characterized as AI, okay? There is a long list. The internet, the World Wide Web, you know, von Neumann machines, transistors, integrated circuits, time-sharing computers, and on and on and on. I mean, these are all people working on things that computers can't do yet, making them do something more. Uh, but it wasn't AI, because they weren't actually trying to make them do hard things people do. They were trying to make what they think they would be able to do to empower people better within a reasonably short number of, of years. OK? So things have changed a lot, exponentially <laughs> a lot, over the last half of the previous century and this century. And I say that, the, I mean, it's pretty clear that the progress that, that has been made in that area has enabled the revolution we're going through right now. Let me just say that a lot of our interest in this, and you know, we've made clear many times that AI is more than machine learning and neural nets, but let's talk about neural nets because that's really the, the topic of the day, chat GPT, et cetera. Um, that's only really, that revolution has come about because of scale because there's a huge amount of training data available, because there's an internet and large storage systems on the internet, and lots of data has been collected by people working on the internet, okay? So that's part one. I mean, you could, you know, this is the era of big data. Uh, and I don't think we know exactly how big GPT-4 is. You know, I've heard numbers that are up to 200 trillion parameters, which sounds, but you know, you got to multiply that by, you know, at least an order of magnitude to look at how much training data that took. So, I mean, that's a lot of data. And the other thing that's happened at the same time is our ability to do massive computing has really come of age. And most of the reason that that's been adequate to this is because we have massively parallel systems of graphics pro processing units, GPUs. So there's my expertise, uh, graphics. They're called GPUs because they were developed to do computer graphics. And they're what make computer games look realistic on your, on your systems w in reasonable time. And they're used all the time in, in, in Hollywood. But um, really what they're doing now that's impacting the world most is rapidly computing you know, training models, training large language models, for example. And so those things have happened, I mean, because the systems can support them, which back in 1958, they weren't anywhere near getting. And they've led to astonishing capabilities coming out of systems to, to all of us. Now, I just want to give you a little sense of the compute part of that. I'm not going to read this graph very carefully. But I want you to notice, if you can read it at all, which is not so easy, that it's a log scale, so, you know, 
you're going up by every one of those horizontal lines is 100 times the last one, right? And so if you look at that place where it becomes blue, which is you know, marked as the uh, deep learning era, you'll see that we started at the number of flops was 10 to the 14. <laughs> Let's see, what's 10 to the 14? Is that like a, I'm not sure I know what the names are. And it, and it ends up, you know, on here at 10 to the 24th. That's a trillion teraflops. I mean, if that, if you, if that doesn't sound big to you, it's because you don't live with these numbers all the time. But, and that, that, that graph is going steeply upward. Now, for people who are interested and want to see what systems they were looking at, I gave you a blow up of this that had system labels on it, but there's not really new information. The other thing that's interesting about this is the doubling time. How long does it take to double the amount of flops it takes to train one of these models? Well, during the deep learning era, it was six months. And it may have tapered off a little bit since then, down to 10 months, but so somewhere between every six and every 10 months, the amount of compute needed to continue scaling these doubles. Now, <laughs> that's kind of scary. So I, I want to stop with sort of, and wrap this up with what I'll call the three communities view of computer science. And it's one that we've had in our department since I've been a member of it. We sort of break it roughly down into people who do theory, people who do systems, and people who do AI, okay? And that you've seen a little bit about what these people do. The theory people are trying to prove what the relationship between problems and capabilities of computers are. They, have, they want to be able to prove things and know what the limits are uh, and are very rigorous about it. Systems people tend to look at where's technology going? What, can I, wh what should I do to make computers more useful in the next five or 10 years, okay? And artificial intelligence people have been working on how do we make computers do hard things that people do this whole time? So what's going on now is the three communities, is, is, and what I can see is these three communities overlap more than ever. They're working together more than ever. They're enabling each other's progress more than ever. It's a great time. This is the right thing. And the other thing that I see is, and Peter and I have had this discussion a few times, is this another boom time followed by a bust for AI? And my you might be surprised that my position on this is no, because I think technology has reached the point where they are now looking ahead at a reasonable time scale to what they want to accomplish, not 60 years, but they think it's eight, <laughs> okay? And so, so, I mean, it's obvious where we're going in some ways next. I mean, you know, the rest of this course is going to be one of these two questions about tomorrow, which is, will we understand what we're doing sufficiently well in time to control it? Well, we're going to have a lot of lectures about that, so I'm not going to say another word about it. But the other one that you might not have thought of that I wanted to introduce here at the end is, will we still be able to make algorithmic and system advances at a rate that will enable us to see the kinds of astonishing progress we've seen? I know people that work on this problem that can tell me the year they think we're going to hit the wall and not be able to scale like that anymore. And it, they, won't, they won't tell me the year, <laughs> but it's not very far out. And so there are some really serious challenges in systems to keep this going if that's going to be the growth rate at which we're doing compute and data analysis. So with that, I'm done, <laughs> and it's time for you to take your quiz.
Okay, welcome back, and thanks for a fascinating lecture, Don. Um, just to, to lead in, I, you know, to emphasize one of the points that Don made, um, I think it's actually uh, very important. Uh, this was in the context of, of those of us who work on AI, keeping some humility even in this time of you know, lots of attention on AI and a lot of great successes. Um, my PhD advisor you know, wanted me to remember that you know, through COVID, um, the thing that, that kept us connected wasn't um, artificial intelligence so much. It was being able to do Zoom and, and video conferences, video conferencing, which is the result of computer systems, the networking aspect of, of computer science. And even this class is made possible because of the systems aspects of computer science that allows um, this real-time video networking. So um, that's to emphasize the point. But uh, to move to the questions, uh, we have first a question for Don on what, uh, just a clarification in some sense, what exactly are non-deterministic machines? Um, and you know, since you used that term in the, in the lecture. Yeah, and let me, let me say that if you found the word non-deterministic to be con confusing, fine. I don't disagree with you. So what, I, what they are is what I described, right? They're this imaginary model that has a machine that can actually replicate itself every time it makes a decision and then make the next step in, on both sides of the decision in parallel. So we can call that non-deterministic because it didn't decide to take one branch of the decision and then the other one. It did them both at once, okay? Now, of course, we can't build that because we can't build machines that make copies of themselves in real time and then make copies of themselves in real time and so on and so on. You know, if we could, then what would happen is we'd be solving problems really fast that took an awful lot of copies of machines to do, right? So it's really a mathematical model to try to understand the limits of what real computers can do. And it has made it possible for us to at least clarify how to address all these issues, but surprisingly, perhaps, it's been impossible to prove that it's actually more powerful. Good, I think we have a question from inside the studio. Please speak loudly. Yeah, so my question is for Dr. Fasso. So in the Venn diagram that you showed previously, there was shown to be an overlap between quantum computers and non-deterministic models. So I was wondering if you could explain that overlap. Well, I mean, that, that is a conjectural picture. But I mean, this is kind of what people believe, right? So if you've got a, if you've got a model, if, if you've got a set of problems that's larger than the ones that you can solve by a deterministic computer, it may include some of the problems that a non-deterministic computer could solve that deterministic ones couldn't, and there's the overlap, and it may not. I mean, we don't actually know that, right? So, so think of, that's the reason there was a dotted line. It's like, you know, this is not something we actually know exactly the size of, but this is what we expect it to look like. Jim, yeah. And then my second question, so previously, Dr. So you mentioned your opinion on in regards, in regards to AI, the AI boom and bust cycle. So I was just wondering, Dr. Stone, could you also give your opinion about that? Yeah, so as Don alluded to, we have sort of, you know, um, we've had this, this discussion. And the so the question was, you know, what, is this another AI, uh, part of an AI boom and bust cycle? And I, I think, you know, the terms that are sometimes used within the field is that there's sort of AI winters, um, which is the time with, that Don alluded to when, you know, people have, have become discouraged because there, were, there was over, um, overblown expectations and then people to say, oh, it was a failure, no more funding, we shouldn't be doing research on that. And in some sense, when I started in the field, that was the sentiment. Um, it was in the early 1990s, there had been a big AI um, you know, boom cycle in the 1980s based on um, sort of rule-based systems or expert systems. And then people realized that that wasn't gonna work very well. Um, this was you know, before we got to some of the probabilistic methods and neural methods that we've talked about since then. Um, and so people would ask me, why am I going into artificial intelligence? We already know that that field is, is you know, sort of washed up. Um, and uh, I did it because of the scientific interest I, I had in it. Um, but um, you know, I, th I think this is at least, you know, it's happened multiple times uh, through the field. And I do think we are in a situation where, um, again, there are some overblown expectations. There's, there's some hype. Um, you know, just because we've had some successes, uh, it doesn't mean that the, you know, that the, the next successes will be, be easy. And, you know, there's sort of this myth of artificial intelligence that because you can beat the world ch champion at chess or at Go or at Jeopardy or, or something like that, which is hard for people to do, um, that, you, that computers can therefore very easily do all the things that are easy for people, like folding laundry and putting away dishes and from the dishwasher and things like that. 
And it's just not true. There's no magic AI dust that you can sprin sprinkle on these problems and, and solve them. And they're, they're actually much harder than, than people tend to think. So I, I think there are, we are, you know, both also having this sort of period of overinflated expectations a little bit. But the other thing that happens that causes this sort of AI boom and bust cycle a little bit is the definition that we've talked about, trying to get computers to do the things they can't do yet. Often, once computers can do something, and then you know, people get used to it and live with it for a while, they stop thinking of it as art artificial intelligence. And I mentioned this a little bit in the, in the first lecture as well. Um, that, that, you know, that, so I think uh, you know, when, that it may be that, that 10 years down the road, or even sooner than that, um, people stop calling uh, the kinds of things we do with ChatGPT as, as, as artificial intelligence and you know, say that that's, uh, you know, that's a chatbot, but that's not doing the, the really uh, difficult, you know, intelligent things um, that, that people do. It's hard to know. I mean, because this, you know, this, this is fundamentally different. There, there is something very general about large language models that wasn't true of many past artificial intelligence um, systems. Um, so maybe this time is different. But, but I do very much feel like we, we have some overinflated expectations, and there's a, there's a high risk that, that things will, will drop off again. But we'll, we'll see. I can't help but chime in here. <laughs> Not that we haven't had this conversation before. Let me give you, so I, I said that the reason I think it's different this time is because technology's caught up to the scale it needs to be to be able to tackle these problems. But that's only one reason. Another thing I told you is that what's happening now, in my view, is that the communities are overlapping more and more they're not really working so much on separate kinds of problems separately anymore. They're actually working on a lot of overlap. For example, graphics right now, I used to tell people that the difference between computer vision and computer graphics is that they're inverses of each other. In graphics, we take a mathematical model and we try to synthesize a realistic picture of it, which is much easier than taking pictures and trying to build a 3D model of it because there's data missing there, you know, and so, so they're very different things. And what's happened now is they aren't very different things. They're actually all one thing. And, and, and in some sense, the state of the art in graphics and in, in a lot of other areas of systems is we've got a good handle on the algorithmically tractable part of those. We've studied them for decades. We've made a lot of progress. We're now at the state where we have to solve the hard versions of those. And guess what, folks? We're all using heuristics now. And so I think what's going to happen is that AI isn't going to be a separate subfield like it has been in the future. It's going to be one of this bag of things that we're all working on towards different ends. It'll all be integrated, and there won't be it won't be possible to have an AI winter because AI will be part of the rest of computing, unless there's a, a, a computer science winter, which I guess could happen. So that's my take on it. So we're probably not going to settle this question here, so I'll move on to some other, um, other questions. One interesting one that came up is in terms of increase in the size of data sets and the computing power required, how much of that gain is achieved by more brute force and how much is achieved by more efficient or purpose-built hardware architectures? Oh, that's an interesting question. So I guess I could interpret it as up till now or from now. So up till now, what's interesting is that there, you know, the algorithms that are normally used for training neural nets and for doing inferencing in neural nets, inferencing in particular is relatively simple, uh, have led to actual hardware that was custom built to do it really fast. And, you know, that's been successful, but that's not the hard problem. The hard problem is training. Training requires a little more flexibility than that, but some of the same capabilities of doing lots of linear algebra really quickly, right? And it turns out that graphics processing units were perfectly adapted to doing that for reasons of graphics. And so what's happened subsequently is that they've been getting customized to be even better at AI tasks. For example, they, they more and more use small numbers, you know, short floating point numbers that weren't really useful for a lot of things before because they are useful for that. And so customization is happening, but the algorithms haven't changed fundamentally. Uh, going forward, it's not clear that we aren't going to have to do a little bit more radical changes in both the algorithms and the systems that support those algorithms. And that's what 
researchers I know that are worried about hitting that wall are thinking that we really, it's not just building better systems, it's gonna have to go hand in hand with better algorithms. Good, we have another sort of clarification question in some sense, it says, has it been proven that the set of all problems solvable on P, N, P, and quantum computers are the same without respect to efficiency in time and space? Oh, you mean, are they all decidable problems? Well, uh, is it just that they're, they're uh, yeah, is it yeah, the are, set? I mean, decidability is, is more of a, you know, is more of a logical question, right? So yeah, decidability doesn't vary so much as, as, as uh, efficiency. Okay. Um, so, uh, so one question that came up, come up uh, recently is how important are computer games at driving AI? Well, <laughs> we'll perhaps, I, I can answer it, but I'm not an AI person. Right. So, so I will say that what's, what's good about computer games is they're synthetic environments. And they're pretty realistic synthetic environments right now. They look realistic, they've got 3D models, they have models of gravity and physics in them. And those kinds of things can be used for things like robotics to, to train robots in environments where you, it's, in, it's impractical to train them on in real environments like that. So, uh, you know, we've done some work in those kinds of areas before. For us, it was for graphics. We were trying to make artificial characters automatically. Uh, and, and what was interesting was that, you know, we were doing evolutionary neural nets and the evolution would find the the glitches in our algorithms and exploit them more efficiently than it would optimize for the pseudo physics and we constantly had to bat it away. So, so it, I think it's useful, but Peter would know more. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I will, uh, um, I'll say that, that uh, historically computer games have had a huge role in, in driving progress in artificial intelligence. In fact, uh, I have a recent article in, in Science that, that catalogs some of that history and also um, predicts that it's going to continue to be the case. Um, we've talked about examples of like chess and Go and poker um, and Jeopardy. And then I've had a role in a, an agent that, that uh, plays some video games, Gran Turismo, and there's other sort of um, open challenges in getting AI systems to play, to play games well. And I think that's, that's going to continue to happen. Um, it's not the, you know, the games are more of a test bed. It's not the end for AI, but it's, um, but it's, it's historically driven, driven a lot of progress. So um, with that, we're, we are out of time. Um, there's some other good questions in here, and especially you know, a, a question that was asked about what will uh, the impact of artificial intelligence be on work in the workforce, and that's the kind of thing that we're gonna be covering um, in the remainder of the course. So looking forward to seeing you, seeing you next week.